morning, everybody. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. Um, yeah, you, yeah, you read my bio. It's like you know a lot of stuff, but you can't work a mic stand. Uh, uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Dr. Ivory Tubbs. I am a psychologist with the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education. Can you hear me okay? Because I don't like to stand in front. You good? How about this? Better? Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm a psychologist with uh, WICHI, Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education. We work a lot in uh, rural areas. And um, one of the things that we do is um, the Mountain Plains Rural Opioid Technical Assistance Center. All right, it's a mouthful. Um, and I will apologize in advance. I'm not from here. It is dry. So uh, my mom would probably take a swing at me right now if she knew I had gum in my mouth. So if y'all don't tell, I won't tell. <laughs> so this morning, what we're going to talk about, and I have to make sure I got all my slides right, because I've been doing several presentations over the last couple of weeks. What we want to talk about today is I want to describe substance use and its motivations and how SUD develops into a disease. I want to define stigma. I want to recognize some strategies at identifying stigma and avoiding stigma about SUD. Then I want to describe some of the trauma um, surrounding SUD. Then the next thing is also to challenge some of your negative beliefs. Um, I'm planning on making some people mad and making some people uncomfortable. Um, if you are expecting a highly clinical presentation, this ain't it. And one of the reasons why is because this is not a subject that we need to have it amongst ourselves as amongst clinicians. We need to have that conversation. But the people we need to reach who need to have this conversation are the peoples in our communities. So they're not they're not looking at graphs. They're not perusing the, the CDC or SAMHSA's website to see what kind of stats are on there. What we've got to do is we've got to condense the information down so that we can disseminate it to the community. So. Yes, I'm that guy. I'm that nerd. I look into etymology. I am. Um, I like to understand why we're saying things. I want, like to understand why things are labeled things. It's one of the reasons why I don't use the word happy with like my patients. If anybody understands that, you understand happy was the Egyptian god who caused the, supposedly, caused the rivers to overflow so the silt would land on the, uh, um, would deposit on the land and it would be nutrient rich and they can grow stuff, right? One of the reasons why I don't use it with my patients is because what does a river do? It's constantly moving, right? So people are constantly looking for happiness. I use joy. That's one of the things that I use. So, all right, there's your session for the day. Leave your copay at the door, all right? <laughs> but that's one of the things that I look at. I look at why we're saying the things that we're saying. Because um, sometimes we don't, always, we don't always recognize why we're saying things, right? We don't always recognize why we're doing things. I remember... Um, I'm going to digress for a second, but not really, okay? Um, I remember a story about uh, this couple that got married, and the wife went in the kitchen, and she started, started making, making dinner. She cut the roast in half, and she put the roast in a pan, put one on one side and one on the other side. The husband said, honey, why, why are you doing that? She said, I don't know. My mom did it. I said, okay. So he called his mother-in-law. He said, mom, why, why, do you, why did you cut the... Roast in half. He said, baby, we, our pan was too small to fit the whole roast. <laughs> That's why we cut it in half. This is one of the reasons why I look into some of the things that we say, because we say stuff. We don't have any idea where the stuff is coming from. So when you start looking at stigma and you recognize that stigma is something that it, it's a it's a symbol that was burned in the slaves or traitors or or criminals. And what would happen is that's an outside sign to everybody around of the mistake that that person made. You can't avoid it. That's where we get tattooing from and stuff like that. Not, I'm not against tattoos. I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying is it is an outward sign. But as of right now, what we do, what we combat is the internal stigma that exists in our communities. And some of the components, excuse me, some of the components of stigma have to do with labeling. It's a status loss. You're discriminating. When I say you, not the collective you, not you. It's uh, 
It was really judgment. And that's some of the things that we've got to convey to people in the community to help them understand you're judging somebody. Who can be infected, uh, affected? Everybody. We've all, we know what we said. We know what we've thought about people. I don't care how long you've done this. We all can. We have to remember that we're not immune just because we've seen it several times. Even when I worked in hospitals, some of my staff, they were, my gosh, they were some of the most judgmental people. Oh, that's Johnny. He's a regular. Did you even find out what was going on with Johnny today? This is where I came from. I was spoken to, speaking to, uh, to Megan and Jennifer earlier, and I told them that my education, introduction into the field, I started at the bottom, literally. This is pre-degree, all of this. I started in group homes, so I got to see things. I got to understand some things. I got to see things that were in books that you get to the real world, that don't work, y'all. So my perspective is different. My perspective is not to sit here and let people show people how smart I am. Yeah, I mean, some of y'all surprised that I'm even standing up here, right? You know, I made it here by myself. That's not my job. My job is to affect the people who need our help. We all know that we don't, we don't, you don't get into this field for money. We get in this field because we care about people. And we have to be mindful that we are not the people who are spreading the disease of stigma. Oops. I'll get to it. All right. Trauma's influence. And I only want to touch on this a little bit because I know Dr. Garza and Howell will touch on this deeper. And I do not want them hunting me down in Utah so nobody will find me. But trauma plays a role, plays a big role. I think, think back to a lot of my patients. Not one patient have I ever had who was dealing with SUD ever said to me, you know what? I was watching Netflix and I just want to go try meth. Don't happen that way, y'all. There's something. There's something that happens. What is it? What is it? Or is it? It, it is. I worked that out. I got the English language down, I think. <laughs> At some point, we don't always know. We don't always know what causes someone to fall into, and I say fall into, because it is accidental. People start this recreationally, right? Where am I at? There it is. ACEs. I won't touch on ACEs too deep because I know, um, I think Jennifer's supposed to be touching on that later, but I don't want to get too deep in this, but what I want to do is I just want to show you that there's a correlation between ACEs and SUD. And one of the things about ACEs that is so important to me is that it is strongly associated, strongly associated with development of SUD, very strongly. Now, it is not, it is not the main determinant. It is not absolutely conclusive. It is not. So please, by no means, don't take that from my message. It is not. But sometimes people are two to four times more likely to report early initiation in the substances with each added ACEs. So again, take a step back, take a step back. And I want you to take this message, just take it in and also take it into your communities because we have to think about that. There's so many people that mask. I had a, just this morning, I was talking to uh, Dr. Yeager and I told her, I woke up to three emergency calls. I had somebody who hopefully finally openly admitted after probably two decades of drinking, they finally opened up and said, you know what, I was trying to hide from stuff. You don't know why people are doing what they're doing. We don't know, and this is what stigma is. Stigma is assuming that you know all the information and you can make a judgment, you can make a determination. And I'm gonna show you something later on as we move forward. These are some of the common misconceptions about substance use disorder. You know, a lot of times, like this, this last one, the bottom one, bottom left, yeah, yeah, bottom left for y'all. You know, people say this is a you problem. This ain't a you problem, y'all. It's a us problem. I'll tell you why it's an us problem. Because 
Substance use, stimulant use, looks like everybody in here. I've had people get up a little upset with me, but this is the truth. When it was a crack epidemic, eh, it was bad. But guess what? That looked mostly like brown people, brown and yellow people. It did. Eh, we're going to keep that over there. But SUD, that's everybody. It looks like everybody in here. I have seen it. It's run a spectrum. I have seen trust fund babies come in just as high as the clouds. Parents are two high-powered lawyers. What do we do? What, what do I do to help my daughter? It looks like everybody. And the thing is that you can be a functioning user. That's what the scary part is. You can be functioning. They could do something about it if they wanted to bad enough. Okay. We don't say that about people who use smokeless tobacco or smoke. I'm not getting on anybody. If you do, do you. My point is, nicotine is just as addictive and sometimes more addictive than cocaine and heroin. Yeah, we don't talk about that much, do we? Uh, we don't say that. Most of them are criminals anyway. No, they're not. What you're trying to do is stereotype. And that's what the problem is. We're stereotyping, we're judging. What is stereotyping? You're judging. They go hand in hand. I know everybody doesn't smoke, but you know what? I'm gonna hit you on something that you, you probably do. What if I told everybody in here who go coffee drinkers to go coffee, go cold turkey on coffee for a week? <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, y'all want me to hurry and get down now. You're like, oh, get in my backyard, get out of my business, right? <laughs> Think about it. About day three, you might start twitching. You're angry as all get out. But what a lot of people don't recognize is caffeine is a legal addictive stimulant. I drink coffee, so I'm in there with y'all. Right. But this is what I want you to understand. It is it's the accepted substance that, that we don't judge. I could quit anytime I wanted to. <laughs> True. No, I couldn't. Yeah. And by the way, please, if you got questions, you got something to say, say it. Speak out. I'm not a talk at you person. I like to have conversations. These are some quotes by some people who were battling. I felt hopeless, like no one cared. People judged me. I was battling alone. How many of you times have you heard this from some of your patients and your clients? What about this one? I don't like you and your kind. Come around here. That's not my neighborhood. People say that kind of stuff. They do. This one hit. The gentleman who said this, I mean, he was fighting back tears. This is a grown man fighting back tears. When you leave someone so vulnerable and frustrated, Instantly, those addictions come back because that is what comforts them. How far have we gone as a society when a substance that can wreak havoc and destroy your life is where you have to find comfort because people don't give it to you? All right, something to think about. I remember growing up, my mom, my parents would let people come in, people come over our house, our kids and stuff like that, right? And uh, I was talking to, again, Megan and Jennifer. I'm from Louisiana, and we, uh, we feed people, right? So they would come over, and you know, I'm just like, why are they, all these people coming over our house? It wasn't that I didn't like people, I just, you know, what in the world? And they always seemed to show up when my dad was grilling steaks. Why steak night? You can't come on meatloaf night? I mean, what happened, huh? Why are y'all in this place? And my mom would tell me something, and I want you to remember this because this is something I'm gonna refer to later. My mom said, if any of my children are in a position where they need help, I would want somebody to extend help to you. I was like, okay. Still gotta be steak night though? Anyway, I just like um, The impact of stigma and the emotional impact of stigma is huge. Um, I've, I've, 
don't, I don't know if I got her name. Uh, a lady earlier who spoke about going to your, your dad's house and the key wasn't there anymore. Yeah. That hurts. That hurts. She may not have had any intention to take anything, but the idea that it could happen hurt. We don't need to stigmatize people. People who use, um, who are challenged with SUD, they're struggling. They're struggling already, y'all. They're carrying with them guilt. They know about the missed opportunities. They know about, you know, the, the family and, and, and people that they've hurt. They know that. There's shame attached to it. It affects us emotionally. Because what do we do? When we're affected emotionally, we act outwardly. If you feel as though you've been discriminated against, what do you do? You physically leave or you physically respond. There is an emotional connection, a physical connection to the emotional impact. And in particular, you know, there's provider stigma. I worked at hospitals where, I mean, it was, it was bad. You have people who are challenged with SUD who need medical attention. Guess what, they're not coming to the hospital, why? Because someone will say that they're med seeking or attention seeking. This is one of the issues with xylazine. When xylazine was introduced into fentanyl, when people began to get abscesses and open wounds on their bodies because of the xylazine, they weren't going to the hospital. It was street medicine. Because they knew if they went to the hospital, they'd be discriminated against. But well, you did it to yourself. Trust me, I, I, I've worked in hospitals. I've worked in a couple of hospitals. When I used to work at the University of Texas Health Science Center, you had a patient come in there acting a certain way. As long as you put that patient, get that patient out of, patient out of harm's way, you can sit that patient in the room as long as you want. I'll, I'll get to them. Why? Because you're already assuming that you know what is going on with that patient. SUD in the brain is something that is it's key to understanding stigma. So I'm not going to go too deep on it and know I'm not a neurologist, but some of the effects of SUD on the brain is that um, it affects your neurotransmitter regulation. It's a lot of neurotransmitter regulation, and that's a chemical. And the neuro, your neurotransmitters, for anybody who does not know, those are the chemicals that send the messages, send the messages. So when you, when people who are challenged with SUD um, tell you that they didn't, they can't recall something or, oh, you know what, I, I, I forgot. Oh, yeah, I'm, oh, it's, it's to the right. They're telling you the truth. It affects your neurotransmitters. It's your reward pathway activation and the reward pathway is responsible for feeling pleasure. And it plays a crucial role in addiction. And in your dopaminergic system, that's the pleasure system. Do you not think? I mean, it's like giving a kid candy. You can put a piece of broccoli on a plate and a piece of candy. What do you think a kid's gonna go after? Depending on how bad you threaten them, I guess I, guess I should say that, right? Depending on how bad you threaten them. They can go for the candy. That's the dopaminergic system. The dopaminergic system is like, come on, I need fun. I need something good right now. Give it to me, give it to me, give it to me, give it to me. This is what their brains are saying to them. They don't fully understand it. But us as clinicians, the people who do this, we have to understand that so that we can convey the message to people in the community to let them know, hey, slow down a little bit, slow down. Let's not judge. These are some of the, the um, neurological effects. Let me, I wanna say something real quick. It's like, If you take into consideration how complex the brain is, I heard somebody, I heard, I heard it said this way, if they were able to build a computer that could do what the human brain could do, it would have to be housed inside the Empire State Building. It would take the waters of Niagara Falls to cool it and the waters of Niagara Falls to power it. Now, think about how delicate all of that is and how quickly Opioids and stimulants can rewrite that. So some of the uh, neurological effects 
you got long-term consequences that um, can include cognitive impairment. What about self-stigmatization? I touched on that earlier. I tell people sometimes, I don't need haters. I'm hard enough on myself. I, I'll do your job for you, don't worry about it. But think about somebody who has been turned away by everybody they know. And part of the reason why they're turned away is because people don't know how to deal with that situation. They've been lied to. I mean, it's real. And that's one of the things that I do, like as when I saw patients, I'll acknowledge your pain. I will acknowledge your trauma. But we're not camping out there. I'll go camping. So I'm not camping out there. And then we start talking about maladaptive behaviors. You know, there are things that when, when SUD has started to re rewire their brain, people, they don't even, they don't do things that take care of themselves. That's one of the reasons why you see people who are unhoused. A lot of the unhoused community, they do have some type of mental illness. Not a large part, but some do. I met a man who had an Ivy League degree, as sane as you and I, who was unhoused. And I asked him, I said, what do, why are you, why are you homeless? And he said something I'll never forget. It was so simple. He said, because all I have to worry about is me. I didn't think about it that way. But again, if I just took him as someone who was unhoused and unkept, I'd have judged him. But the concept of all I got to do is take care of me, y'all, I mean, that just, like, man, you know what? You don't have to worry about a light bill. You don't have to worry about groceries. You sleep where you sleep. I mean, if you think about the simplicity in that, now I'm not saying anybody should, Go for that life. I don't want that life. But I mean, think about the simplicity in it. Sometimes we don't understand what motivates people to do the things that they do. And some of the, the just again with the neurological effects, y'all, they, we have to understand that the substance use, when it has been long term, has now gotten into their brains. It, they, just, they can't just stop. How many times have you talked to any of your patients or clients and they were like, I hate this stuff. I hate doing this. But guess what? They've created the neural pathways in their brains to say, give it to me. They hate doing it. They hate being a slave to it. Not everybody. But this is the, these are some of the neurological effects. Why am I going this deep? I'll tell you shortly, okay? Substance use and co-occurring, we talked about that earlier. There are a lot of people who, um, there are a lot of people who are self-medicating. I remember I had a gentleman who was uh, diagnosed with schizophrenia. And he told me I smoke crack. I didn't judge him. I just wanted to hear. I was inquisitive. I'm like, why do you smoke crack? It quiets the voices. I can't judge that man. I don't hear voices. I do tell my patients at times when I had patients, I used to tell them, talk to yourself. Talk to yourself, tell yourself, motivate yourself, encourage yourself. Just don't do it in a different voice, but talk to yourself. <laughs> right? You know, other voices, eh. got to get into medication. There you go. There we go. The psychophysiological effects. Altered brain function. Just touched on that, right? Psychological dependence. Just touched on that. You feel like you, they feel like they need to have it. Impaired judgment. And I don't even need to go to through the rest of these, but those first three right there is enough to get you to understand. And I know you do, so I don't say you personally. So when you talk to the community, you're like, y'all, I know it, it sucks. These people out there struggling, but you know what? Their brains are telling them to do something. Their brains have been rewired. 
And it's the message that we have to get out to the community to tell them, again, like I said, if you were looking for something super clinical, uh, this is not it, because it is the plain language that we have got to infuse in our community. It's just plain language. We can understand it. I can hit you with a bunch of polysyllabic words so that you think that I'm smart. But I've worked in some of the roughest parts. You talk to gangsters and stuff like that. If you say you love me, show me, homie. Show me. I could get there and talk about all kinds of, well, you know, your childhood and, you know, are you antisocial? Nobody want to hear all that. Oh, escort me out of there. Or give me an opportunity to leave. <laughs> if I don't, then it's all me, right? But with these, these top three, this is a foundation for you to use whenever you have any type of stigma training. Let's back up. Let's back up. Let's not talk about how to be nice. Like Thumper's mom said, if you can't say something nice, don't say something at all. That's not it. We gotta give people a foundation. I became a psychologist because I'm a why person. I didn't come into psychology because I had traumas that I was trying to figure out. I wanted to help people and here I are. Again, just more about the psychosocial, psychophysiological effects. There's some treatment approaches, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. You got counseling, you got meditation, meditate, meditation, yeah, you got that too. But you got medication, you got the map. Medicated assisted treatment. These are some of the things that can combat that. I like this one. Don't trust everything you see. Salt looks like sugar. I had someone call me one day from work. They said, uh, not my job, <laughs> not my job work. But they, somebody called me and said, oh, my, my coworker, they're, they're, just, uh, they're, they're on drugs. I know they're on drugs. They're just, they're up and down and they're doing this and they're doing that. Blah, blah, blah. Well, I'm a psychologist, I'm asking questions. What are they doing? Oh, they're just unsettled. This, that, and the other. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. <laughs> Methamphetamine use looks like severe anxiety. Someone with bipolar disorder can exhibit psychomotor agitation. What is that? It's moving. Just can't. Can't just. They can't settle themselves. But that looks like meth use. If you have an opioid user who comes in, and I can tell you how many patients I've had, that if they've got enough opioids in their system, they will present with a flat affect and come in and you think that they are clinically depressed. Not even not just high. Slow down. That's why I said this, this, this quote at the top, sugar looks like salt. I don't know. You don't know. My brother is a professional, does not have any substance use issues. I've literally seen my brother. We went out to eat one day and he was so tired. My brother's the type of person that will fall asleep anywhere. He doesn't have narcolepsy, he just falls asleep. I've literally seen him, had his food in hand, sitting in a chair and boom, gone. And people are looking like, what the fuck? You know, somebody was like, get your boy. <laughs> He's all right, I promise. He's okay. I promise he's okay. But had I walked in on the outside, from the outside in and looked at that, I'm like, oh, that dude is high as a kite. No, not he's sleeping. He's sleeping. Salt looks like sugar. Talk to people in the community. Just because you see something that looks like something, hmm, might not be it. And the last one, stimulant use can mirror a manic episode. You ever seen anybody on uh, a lot of coke in their system? A lot of meth? They're some of the most unsettled people. But if I were only looking at one, I would think that it's a manic episode. It would be until I had questions. I talked to them. Hey, what's going on there? Come to find out that person that this other person called me about at their job who was tweaking. Guess what? She was diagnosed with bipolar. Ooh. What if they would have ran that up the run it up the ladder? Went to HR. Now you got people 
you put this person on, that, on the HR's radar because you assumed. She might not have had a medication today. This is why I say slow down, slow down. Let's take a minute. Figure out what you're looking at first. Ask a question, have a conversation. The impact of person first language on stigma is, it is immense. I'm a sports guy. Does anybody know, well, in base, baseball, Trey Turner, shortstop for the Philadelphia Phillies. They just got run off the planet yesterday by Arizona, so they won't be making it to the World Series. But anyway, Trey Turner, batting champion, all-star. He went into a slump. And if anybody knows sports, Philadelphia is one of the worst and best places to play. They are the epitome of eat their own. They will eat their own young and they will praise them at the same time. Well, Trey was in a slump and they booed him mercilessly. And I promise y'all, this is not, this is true. You can go look, look this up. They booed him mercilessly. They had a, one of the prominent Phillies fans got on social media and said, you know what, every time he comes to play, let's, uh, let's give him a standing ovation. Now don't get me wrong, he was stinking up the place. So he comes to bat at home, they give him a standing ovation. I wasn't there, but I can imagine if, you, if they had booed me five, six, 10 games, and I come there, you give me a standing ovation. I'm looking around, I don't know about y'all. I'm like, who the hell do you know? Me? I know I would, right? Well, what ended up happening, and this is true, you look it up. In three games, he went four home runs. He had four home runs. I used to play baseball. I didn't play at that level, clearly. I used to play baseball. It is difficult to throw a stick at a ball being hurled at you. This man went three games and four home runs. Why? Because they encouraged him. What does that have to do with stigma? Not encouraging people. Sometimes that one conversation that you have with somebody that might get not, might not get them into the treatment, but if they know they can come back and have a conversation with you and you talk to them like a human, you know what, okay. I'm hoping humanity is restored. The impact is measurable, but then at the same time, it's immeasurable. Because I remember some things, I've been in college over 30, 30 years. Um, I remember something somebody told me as a freshman at college. I will not forget this, this man. I was a freshman uh, on track team, I left track practice or whatever, and there was a lady, uh, a young lady who walked past us. And I got to college at 17, so I was massively insecure and immature. And I was with an upperclassman who walked past somebody. Um, he said to the, to the young lady, you look nice today. I wouldn't have looked at her twice. I'm not saying I'm a prize. I just wouldn't have looked at her twice. Right? So I kept moving. So we walked down a little further. I said, what, what are you doing? I'll never get what he said. I was like 18 at the time. He said, I might have made her day. It's interaction. Little, one interaction, two interactions. You see somebody. Show them that kindness. And this is why I say it's measurable. Measurable at the same time, it's, it's immeasurable because you don't know how far that's gonna go. You don't know that that one conversation that you have with that person is not going to encourage them to encourage somebody else. We don't know. Transformative language. It is powerful. It humanizes people. We've got to remember that the things that we say, there's a human attached to that. It reduces blame. It combats stereotypes. It changes public perception. The media is notorious. I remember when Xylazine hit the scene, and they were like, oh, it's a zombie drug. People are passing out and their arms are falling off. And it's, stop. We, granted, we can't address every media outlet. We can't. But you know, it's that starfish analogy. I can get that one, and I can get that one, and I can get that one. It's the simple language. And it fosters effective communication. Don't add to people's troubles, is what I guess I could say. Just don't, don't add to them. They're already struggling enough. 
Just don't add to them. I had a patient one time, and this is, uh, this is about fostering that communication, humanizing individuals. I had a patient one time who, uh, he presented with suicidal ideations. I said, okay, go on in. And one thing that I try to do is I try to match the, kind of match the energy of my patient. You know, if they were too hype, I wouldn't go way up there. That's not happening. But I at least had to come in like, hey, we're good, right? All right. And for some reason, they would always call me when they had some of the toughest patients. And I didn't understand this earlier. And uh, we were discussing this earlier with uh, Jennifer and Megan. I, I didn't put myself in a lot of these situations. But you know what? The information and the, the knowledge that I gained from them priceless. So anyway, it comes in. I'm doing the assessment. Assessment's like four pages. It's invasive. Oh, my gosh. I mean, it's one of the things that... I'm looking at this thing like, I wouldn't answer half of these questions. But I had to do the assessment, to establish a report. We talked, he saw that, man, I'm not here to judge you. I just need to understand what you're here for so I can help you, right? I can prescribe the, the right treatment. So he took a step back. He said, I need to show you this. And is, is anybody, any hunters, anybody hunt? You know the difference between bird and buckshot? You know the difference between bird and buckshot, right? He stood up and he said, I guess I need to show you this. I'm about this shirt. Let me open this up. You know what I saw? It looked like he got shot with bird shot. He was doing math. And he hid his pain underneath his clothes. They didn't go down his arm. They didn't go up his neck. They stayed in the central area. But had I not had that conversation with him, had I not taken the time, look, I'm not judging you. I personally don't care what you're here for. I really don't. That's not being indifferent. But what that says is there's some people who look at that when patients are admitted. I don't look at that because what that means is that if, if I come across something that I don't like, I might be less likely to work with you. That's why I'm like, I don't care. Come in. It's a hospital. Come in. I gotta work with you anyway. I'm here for the next eight hours. Guess what? Come in. That's kind of my mentality. Not that again, not that I'm being indifferent. But again, this man, after establishing that rapport, opening up that communication so that he could tell me, I'm into a math. And hiding, literally showing me his torso. I mean, I sat back. He was probably hiding that from the people he loved. Because if the people he loved saw that, they would know that he was hurting. And some people, and any of us who have kids in here, if your kids fall down and they get hurt, you hurt. We just do. So he was hiding that under his clothes. And he felt comfortable enough with me to tell me, look, man, this is what's happening. And I promise you, I am not exaggerating. It looked like somebody pumped him with birdshot. Not buckshot because he wouldn't be standing, but it was birdshot. And he just, he was riddled because he picked. You know, you know about meth and it causes you to give you these hallucinations at times that cause you to pick. This is one of those examples that has stuck with me for a long time. Man, slow down. You do not know. You don't know why they got to where they got to. You literally don't know. These are some of the uh, these are some of the alternatives to some of the things that we say. And alternative language is is huge because we got to infuse something new, right? I've talked to, and some of you may know this, and and I say this, I said it before. There, there are things that we talk about amongst ourselves, right? But the stuff, oops, okay, stuff on the right side. These are the things that we're trying to talk to our patients and the community about. And these are the things that we say amongst ourselves when we're writing on the chart or what have you. But I can tell you this, if you're talking to somebody who's been in recovery and they say, oh, I'm a junkie, don't correct them. You know why? Because some people identify with their trauma. 
That very trauma is what propelled them into treatment. What you do is say, you know what? Okay, um, I got five minutes to tell me to get out of here. All right, um, I want to share something real quick. Um, these are my uh, these QR codes, and and if you email me, I can send these to you. These QR code for a uh, for the person first language, and also for the survey. But again, you can email me for that. I want to leave you with this. I want you to read this and see how disgusting this is. I was told that my son's death was Darwinism. If I saw him over a dozen in the street, I'd step over and keep going. That's disgusting. That's another human being. This is my contact information, but I want to leave you with this. You remember I told you earlier, my mom said, you know, if somebody is, oh, I, I extend help. I extend kindness to other people in case my children need it. Well, as we grew, that message was reduced to three words. And this is what I want you to take with you when you go back, when you're working with your patients, when you start to feel burned out, and you don't feel like you're making a difference. My mom's message was this, that's somebody's baby. That's somebody's child. That very person that you wanna talk bad about, you got some people who are hoping and praying that somebody extends some love and kindness to that person. I know we get burned out, we get cooked. I left the field for about two, three, four years, something like that because I was just tired. But when you take a step back and realize that is somebody's child, it gives you a whole different perspective on judging somebody. Y'all, thank you for your time. Thank you for spending time with me today. I appreciate it. Please reach out to me if you want to have a conversation, need some more information or what have you. Thank you. I said it before, there, there are things that we talk about amongst ourselves, right? But the stuff, oops, okay. stuff on the right side, these are the things that we're trying to talk to our patients and the community about. And these are the things that we say amongst ourselves when we're writing on the chart or what have you. But I can tell you this, if you're talking to somebody who's been in recovery and they say, oh, I'm a junkie, don't correct them. You know why? because some people identify with their trauma. That very trauma is what propelled them into treatment. What you do is say, you know what? Okay, um, I got five minutes to tell me to get out of here. All right, um, I wanna share something real quick. Um, these are my, uh, these QR codes. And, and if you email me, I can send these to you. These QR code for a, uh, for the person first language and also for the survey. But again, you can email me for that. I want to leave you with this. I want you to read this and see how disgusting this is. I was told that my son's death was Darwinism. If I saw him over a dozen in the street, I'd step over and keep going. That's disgusting. That's another human being. This is my contact information, but I want to leave you with this. You remember I told you earlier, my mom said, you know, if somebody is, oh, I, I extend help. I extend kindness to other people in case my children need it. Well, as we grew, that message was reduced to three words. And this is what I want you to take with you when you go back, when you're working with your patients, when you start to feel burned out and you don't feel like you're making a difference. My mom's message was this, that's somebody's baby. That's somebody's child. That very person that you wanna talk bad about, you got some people who are hoping and praying that somebody extends some love and kindness to that person. I know we get burned out, we get cooked. I left the field for about two, three, four years, something like that because I was just tired. 
But when you take a step back and realize that is somebody's child, it gives you a whole different perspective on judging somebody. Y'all, thank you for your time. Thank you for spending time with me today. I appreciate it. Please reach out to me if you want to have a conversation, need some more information or what have you. Thank you.